Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to a discussion here at the first ever virtual climate summit on women's leadership in fighting climate change. My name is Hiba Ali. I run a news organization called Iran News, which reports from the front lines of humanitarian crises to inform prevention and response. So our journalists around the world cover wars, they cover disasters, they cover refugees and migration, and increasingly they're covering the humanitarian implications of climate change. And in our reporting, we consistently see that um, the impact of crises is even more severe on women in particular. Women and children account for more than three quarters of people who are displaced by crises. Women and girls are more likely than men to die in natural disasters and at a younger age. And women often carry a heavier burden in crisis situations. On top of that, they have specific needs, pregnant or lactating women in particular, um, and, and are at risk uh, of, of specific abuses. And I'm thinking here about sexual and gender-based violence. And when it comes to climate change in particular, we at Erin have seen women often bearing the greatest burden of erratic changes in weather patterns because they're often the mainstay of agricultural production. And so women are, are absolutely affected by crises and, and by climate change and yet often overlooked both their specific needs and the role that they can play in, in being part of the solution. So we are here today to try to look at that intersection between gender and climate. And, and Erin, as a news organization, really tries to amplify the voices of women in, in climate situations because women are not just victims. They are, as I mentioned, part of the solution. Just a few minutes ago, you saw a video produced by our team at Erin of Lucian Gao, a woman farmer in Kenya who bought a solar panel to harvest the sun that was burning her crops. Um, and this is just one example of many of the, the women heroes at the heart of, of climate action. So we have with us today a lovely all-woman panel to talk about this issue and people joining us from as far as Canada, Costa Rica, Switzerland and the Marshall Islands in some very early and late time zones. So thank you to all of the panelists that are here for this panel and um, it is a, a great pleasure to moderate a, a fully um, female panel. Before we get started, I'll remind everyone that the Twitter hashtag for the summit is at Virtual Climate Summit, and you can ask questions for the panelists through the hashtag CVF Summit Panel. They'll be fed to me and I will feed them to the panelists, so please do um, keep the questions coming. So I'm going to kick things off with President Hilde Heine of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, which uh, I just realized was the first country to actually ratify the Paris Agreement um, and President Heine is also the chair of a grouping of 48 states that are most vulnerable to climate change, known as the Climate Vulnerable Forum. President Heine was the first female president of the Marshall Islands, which itself is at risk of being wiped off the map by climate change. So, President Heine, I'd love for you to, to tell us a little bit more about, you know, in the lead up to this summit, you chose 10 people to be champions for the summit to amplify the message and to be ambassadors, and they were all women. Why? Um, you'll just have to unmute yourself, Madam President. That okay? Can you hear me now? All right. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, thank you. I was just saying it's a pleasure to serve on this panel with uh, panelists, uh, distinguished ladies on the panel. Uh, talking about a very important uh, topic, gender and climate change. Um, I am inspired by um, a quote from uh, U.S. Uh, Supreme Justice uh, Ruth uh, Ginsburg. She says, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. So I think from that perspective, you know, women, women belong everywhere. Um, in the homes, playground, you know, hospital, uh, governments, uh, everywhere. And uh, climate change is no different, really. Uh, the decisions there that are made affect the lives of uh, families, children, uh, uh, everywhere. So the special leadership and engagement of women uh, in tackling climate change has been exemplary, I think. That's, uh, that's how I look at it. 
there have been ex ex exemplar uh, women uh, participating in uh, various aspects of climate change, leading the leading the efforts on climate uh, change and uh, UNFCCC. You know, we've seen uh, women uh, being executive uh, directors there and leading the charge there, and they've done uh, exemplary work. And I think it's important to highlight the work that they're doing in engaging communities as well as uh, leaders around the globe to to bring solutions to this one challenge that uh, face all of us. So, uh, you know, when we uh, were forming or trying to organize this uh, CVF, uh, we felt uh, it was important to highlight the work of these, uh, these women. And also to, uh, you know, for other young women to see the role models. Because I think this is the one of the important uh, uh, aspect uh, of um, of uh, mentoring younger girls for them to see role models to see that uh, they themselves can be leaders in their own right. Uh, sometimes uh, their uh, girls are hearing that they cannot do this, they cannot do that. So with uh, proper role models uh, out there they themselves can see their dreams come true by realizing that it can be done. So I think it's important for, uh, for us as uh, leaders anywhere to see where we can uh, uh, bring women to take lead in, uh, in aspects of decision making. Uh, and so uh, that was one of the you know, reasons that we, uh, we engage all women uh, champions in this effort of uh, bringing together the Climate Vulnerable uh, Virtual Summit uh, that is going on now. Uh, in the Marshall Islands, I think uh, this is an area that we're looking at and trying to uh, bring uh, more women into, into all aspects of decision making. And it's not easy. It hasn't been easy. Uh, in our parliament, there are only three women in our parliament. I'm being one of the, the three. So about 9%. Uh, and it's been 3% until uh, th three years ago. So it's it's a very low percentage of women in our parliament. Uh, not only that, but uh, in, in our economic sector, we also need to engage women in the economic sector. Uh, when you look at the, the livelihood of families, it's the women who make decisions. It's the women who, who, um, who budget the family affairs and budget and, and so on. And when, you, when we experience climate change, it is true that women uh, take on the, the burden. Uh, they're more, uh, uh, how should I say, they're, uh, they're the ones that uh, are responsible for a lot of things. The, the burdens of uh, taking care of the families and uh, feeding the family, bringing water to the family, bringing firewood. Uh, so on and so forth, it's, it all uh, depends on the women. So it's added burden on women in our communities. Uh, women in our outer island communities uh, sell, uh, they make handicrafts and they sell them to make a uh, living and to support their families. And when climate change, uh, when we have droughts, for example, uh, some of the trees that provide the materials for, the, for these women to make uh, handicrafts uh, die. And so they have to uh, work on replanting. Uh, so in one of the communities in one of our island, uh, the women uh, were organized to do a, a mapping of what kinds of plants are, uh, are uh, growing in, in different parts of the community. And that helped them to identify where the food plants are planted, what kind of food plants are there, what kind of other plants for handicrafts are there, where they're located, the kinds that are not being planted. And then they go about than uh, planting, uh, planting trees in the community. So they take it on themselves to, you know, to take care of uh, their very needs, uh, the needs for the, for for their families as well as for, uh, for, uh, uh, for the economic benefits of the family. So it is true that women take on added burden uh, during climate. Uh, activities when there are impacts in the communities. So it's all the more reason for us to look at women and to try to, um, to provide more capacity building for women. Uh, because regardless of where they are, you know, they do need to take care of their families. Uh, some women are lucky to have uh, someone take care of their families for them. But for the most part, 
you know, we have to rely on our ability to take care of our own families. So uh, having role models and uh, capacity building for women, I think those uh, areas are needed for us to, to, to work on. And we have actually one of those role models uh, with us today and one of the, the champions of the summit um, who we'll come to in a moment. Um, but I wanted to pick up on, on where you left off in terms of the, the burden, because in fact, we, you know, it, women experience climate change in ways that you might not really imagine. And we've reported, for example, on in some cases where um, in African countries, uh, women are often um, the, the farmers. And if they lose a, a harvest as a result of, of climate change, that this can end up leading to domestic violence at home because um, there are husbands who may have purchased the seeds and expected um, a good return on their investment get very frustrated. So it has implications that you might not imagine. And I wonder if I can turn now to, to Caroline Kende Robb, the Secretary General of CARE International, which is a development and humanitarian agency that works in some 93 countries around the world. Um, Caroline, some of what um, Madam President has described as, as the impact of climate change on women in the Pacific, um, do you see that in other regions around the world? And, and what are some of the trends? We're just going to have uh, uh, Caroline's microphone issues sorted. So while we wait for Caroline to come through, I'm going to um, repeat the question because I'm not sure she heard it. Um, so Caroline, I was asking if you could give us a sense of the trends around the world in terms of how women are affected by climate change in some of the countries that you're working. Okay, I think we're having some technical problems with Caroline, so we'll come back to her. I'm going to move forward to um, uh, Catherine Abreu, who is the executive director at Climate Action Network Canada, which is a network of uh, NGOs that are working to promote climate action. Um, Catherine, we've been talking a little bit about the impact of women on, on uh, of climate change, sorry, on women in particular, um, and yet women aren't always part of the conversation in how to tackle climate 23 and so on. Um, how would you describe the, the voice that women have in climate negotiations and climate policy? Thanks, Heba. Um, so very much looking forward to hearing Caroline's intervention, of course. Um, but as we heard from Madam President, uh, and, and as you detailed yourself, of course, women are often on the front lines of climate impacts, but it's true that women are also at the forefront of climate solutions. And if we're going to actually solve the cr climate crisis, we need gender responsive climate policies. And that requires the active participation of women, of course. Um, at the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the issue of enhancing women's participation in international climate negotiations has actually been on the table since some of the earliest conferences of parties, COPs. So the first time we had that mentioned was in 2001 at COP7. It was mentioned again in a COP decision in 2010 at COP16. Um, and then finally, in 2012, we had what Christine what uh, Christiana Figueres referred to as the Doha miracle. So this was a commitment to enhancing the role of women in international climate negotiations that led a couple of years later, later to the Lima work program on gender. And then finally at COP23 last year in Bonn, we had the agreement of the gender action plan. So that gives us a sense of how challenging it is to confront the institutionalization of gender inequity, which is a, fact of many institutions. And even a relatively young institution like the UNFCCC has struggled to uh, find ways to address that gender imbalance. So that's part of the challenge that we are facing. Um, but there are a number of initiatives that are focused on supporting women, building that capacity, as Madam President mentioned. Um, and one of those is the Women's Delegate Fund, which was started in 2009 through a collaboration collaboration between Finland, the Global Gender uh, and Climate Alliance, and the Women's Environment and Development Organization, or WIDU. 
And that is a fund that's specifically targeted at training up women delegates, at sending them to COPs and making sure that they are embedded at the heart of international climate negotiations. Um, so we're slowly seeing that improvement. Last year in Bonn, about 42% of the, delegate, the national delegations that went to those negotiations were made up of women. However, only about 16% of the heads of delegations were women. And those are numbers from We Do, who assess gender parity in UNFCCC negotiations every year. So while we're seeing an increase in participation of women, we're not necessarily seeing um, a rapid enough increase in uh, the, the heads of delegations or that that fe female leadership being put at the forefront of the negotiations. Um, consistently, we, we hear from climate communications research. So there are studies in Canada, Australia, the United States, the UK, other parts of Europe and the developing world that... Uh, it is really women who care the most about climate change. They respond and feel that they are most directly um, implicated in taking climate action. And, and yet we see that many institutions that deal with climate change and indeed many of our communications around climate change do not focus on targeting that demographic, on targeting um, women. And I think that as a community of actors, it's incumbent upon us to think about the ways that we can change how we speak about these issues and how we center the role of women. And that is why um, the, the leadership that President, Madam President has shown in centering the role of women in the Climate Vulnerable Forum um, is a really excellent example of how we can move in that direction. Thank you so much. That's, that's Fascinating, um, the, the question around messaging and how uh, women are targeted, and I hope to come back to that in some of the conversation. I'm going to come back to Caroline now um, because, you know, why is it important that women be at the table? What is it that is unique about their experience? If you could tell us a little bit about what you're seeing on the ground to help contextualize the importance of having women at the table. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this historic summit where very excited to, to, to join and indeed CARE has been engaged for a very long time in the Climate Vulnerable Forum, indeed since before the Paris Agreement was adopted. And we, like many organisations, we continue to advocate for greater ambition in, in climate and, and very much keep within this 1.5 degree limit. And I think, uh, as, as many of you would recognise, uh, you know, we have been fighting for social justice and poverty reduction for many years. And our focus has always been on women and girls. And when we look into the, the, the climate space itself, we can see that climate change has been, as has been very clearly articulated here, it exacerbated very much the existing inequalities and injustices that we see today. And I, I take very much what Catherine just said. I mean, it's incredibly difficult to change institutions. I used to work at the World Bank and IMF, and these institutions are incredibly difficult to change. And they're also planted on top of and inside of um, a world that is still very much um, full of inequalities and injustices and prejudices against women, uh, you know. So we're, <laughs> we're, always going to be, we're always going to be fighting, I think, and, um, you know, so this is this is going to be an ongoing battle, and uh, you know, the I I do believe it's possible to change, but I don't think it is something we can just say we've changed and we're done. So I think I think uh, what we see at Care on the Ground again is what's been very clearly articulated here that women and girls are often most negatively affected by climate change, and I I don't really want to go into all the details as 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 people have said here. But I want to stress a point that I think this forum is, is doing, and, and this is very much what we see at CARE. And less recognized is, is that women and girls are not just victims, but they're also active and indeed powerful agents of change. And this change, it brings benefits to their own lives and it brings benefits to the communities. So while women and girls are suffering negatively from the effects of climate change, they're also taking a leading role in managing the impacts of climate change on the ground. And we need to urgently scale up. I mean, we're trying to do that in care. All our programs are designed to do that. 
but is it extremely challenging as the other participants have alluded to. I want to give an example of a care project in the Philippines, in fact, and here it was a gender in emergencies and um, looking at uh, the role of women in leading the humanitarian response. And I want to mention just one woman who was called Minette Jerusalem, and she survived one of the most powerful typhoons, which is Typhoon Haiyan, and together with her team and with a relief agency, she's helped support over 23,000 families. And what they have been doing is developing evacuation plans and plans on how to provide basic training on how to protect themselves and their belongings. And it's this kind of detailed uh, project um, planning that we do within the communities, with women's groups and with girls, that I think is vital. So what we are basically saying at CARE is that we need as many climate heroes or heroines as possible to fight for climate justice. And climate justice and gender justice go hand in hand. And we see many of our climate heroines are from Tanzania or Niger, Peru, West Bank, Vietnam, and they are trying to change what they do in their communities. But we still have a long way to go because we need to connect what happens at the community level to the regional level, to the national level, and to the, to the global level. And here we still have a, lot of, a long way to go. And, and actually, we have representation from each of those levels here uh, today, so I'm looking forward to, to hearing about those different levels. I want to remind everyone um, watching that the hashtag for the summit is Virtual Climate Summit, and that you can join the discussion by asking your questions on Twitter um, using the hashtag CVF Summit Panel. Um, I'm going to turn to Winnie. Uh, Bianima now, uh, who is the executive director of Oxfam International and one of the 10 women champions of the summit that, that Madame President mentioned earlier. Um, Winnie's a renowned women's rights leader. She is a human rights defender and a global authority on gender dimensions of climate change. Um, Winnie Oxfam, like CARE, is working in, in um, many countries around the world on the ground and seeing women on the front lines of climate change. And, and as Caroline said, you know, they are not just victims, they are often um, actually actively working to mitigate the effects of climate change. So could you, um, sh you know, share what you're seeing on the ground and also maybe answer that question that Caroline posed about, you know, you said it's so difficult to scale this up. Why? Uh, Winnie, we can't hear you. So you might just have to unmute. Thank you, Heba. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Good. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say what an honor it is to be on this all-women panel and to be a climate champion, thanks to President Hilda Hein. Oxfam, the organization I lead, strives to achieve a world, a just world without poverty. And that can't be achieved without tackling climate change and without tackling gender inequality. They are tied together. Oxfam works with women on the front lines of the climate crisis around the world. We are seeing how women are fighting the impacts of climate change. They are the first line of defense against extreme weather in their homes and in their communities. Let me explain why this is so. Tradition and culture have placed the caring role for families on women. So as climate change takes grip, it's women's care role that makes them the climate leaders because they must innovate, they must find solutions, and they do. It's women who must adapt and find new ways to feed their families, new crops to grow, new ways to grow them, new ways to cook, to save energy. It's women who must walk, as someone said earlier, further and further to find water and energy for domestic use. In my country, Uganda, women are already walking up to six hours a day to fetch water. And as the dry seasons become longer, women are forced to walk even longer. You know, I met the G7 leaders this year during a meeting with the Gender Advisory Council that was put together by President Trudeau. 
I said to those leaders that anyone who doubts the science of climate change should try debating this with women walking further every year to fetch water. This is the proof of climate change. So when disasters strike, as it happened uh, as a drought in Afghanistan right now, it's girls who are pulled out of school in order to struggle with their families to make ends meet. It's women who are the last to eat, who will go without food when it's not enough. For example, in Malawi, female-headed households are twice as likely than male-headed households to reduce the number of meals they eat in response to climate shocks. This is evidence. So why is this not scaled up? Why, is, why are uh, responses not scaling up and addressing women's needs? Because of what we know, what President Hein has just said, that women are not a part of decision-making at every level. So they are not part of conceptualizing responses. They are not part of implementing responses. That is why. And that's why the question of women's decision-making is so critical. Thank you so much, Wanyan. I'm, I'm excited that we have with us actually a woman who is part of um, decision-making at high levels uh, and of conceptualizing responses. A Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica, uh, Lorena Aguilar, is with us. And, and Costa Rica is a member of the Climate Vulnerable Forum as one of its countries affected by climate change. I'm just going to turn off my video because I think we're having some challenges with the audio. Um, Vice Minister Aguilar is also a co-founder of the World Alliance of Gender and Climate Change. Uh, Vice Minister, when you talked about the climate efforts of women fighting climate change at the national level, um, can you tell us about this one initiative that I found quite fascinating, which is to um, apply an environmental democracy lens to your foreign policy. What does that look like in practice? Well, good morning, good night, good evening to all of us. We're in different parts of the world. Have a, thank you very much. Yes, I mean, Costa Rica, first of all, is a Costa, uh, country that we know that is recognized internationally on two areas, sustainable development and the respect for human rights with a tremendous special attention to women rights, inclusion. And as we respect biodiversity, we also respect the diversity and promote the respect of that diversity. In Costa Rica, uh, our actual president has made these two objectives an internal and one of the heart of our foreign policy. In Costa Rica, we are aware that we make uh, women make half of the world's 7.6 billion people in the world, and that it is illogical to ignore this power source, source for climate solution. We don't think it is only the smart thing to do, it's the only way of doing it. Bringing women's uh, voices um, into the climate change solutions. However, at the country level, and this is something that in, uh, we have also worked uh, with other countries. We have an integral approach to ensure that these international policies that we have been able to move forward, like Costa Rica was instrumental in the approval of the gender action plan, plan, uh, plan sorry, in the last COP. And, and the way they were looking at this in an integral way is what we call the right eyes for climate change. They have to be inclusive by ensuring the participation and voices of all groups, irrespective of ethnicity, religion, um, age, or class. But they also have to be innovative. Uh, we have to move beyond the ordinary traditional solutions. This is not only seeing women as the ones that can do small things, like a little garden or raising only cheeks, uh, chickens or pigs. It has to bring innovation into some of the uh, solutions. Women involved in renewables, the solar farms, 
um, it also has to have the eye to improve the quality of life for both women and men. We're not thinking about any type of solutions. And it also has to increase the sustainable development uh, by ensuring that what we're doing, it's nature-based solutions. And this, the most important thing, it has to uh, incite in transformational changes, changes in the gender gaps so that women can play and thanks to this, are playing that role as agents of change, inspiring the last I in our process, actors at all levels, and pushing beyond um, business as usual. And um, we, we are seeing that uh, there is a great initiative within UNFCCC that is called Momentum for Change. And there is a pillar that is called Women for Results. These are examples of women all around the world that are embracing precisely these eyes. And this is what Costa Rica is doing, not only in our international policy, but also in our country. Thank you. And actually, there's a question um, following up on your... I'll just have you, can you, Vice Minister, so that we can avoid the echo. Um, but being with you, uh, we have a question from Neil in Switzerland on uh, more specifically how women leaders are contributing to raising climate ambition in Costa Rica. And so maybe you could give us a few. I'm sorry, I lost you. No Can problem. You we cannot get through a virtual summit with a few technical challenges. Uh, so there's a question from the audience. The audience. Mm -hmm. And I'll have you just mute while I ask it. Which is uh, from Switzerland. How are women leaders contributing to raising climate ambition in Costa Rica? If you could give a few examples of, of what you've just described. Yeah, well, we all know our dear, famous friend, Christiana Figueres, that one that make um, the Paris uh, Agreement come to a reality. She's one of our Costa Rican leaders. For example, our first lady, which is also an architect, is the one that is um, leading the decarbonization plan of Costa Rica. Costa Rica abolished its um, army 70 years ago. Now we're going to abolish our dependency to fossil fuels. Uh, this is our commitment to the world. And the whole program on mobility and transformation to um, our um, vehicle system that is consuming fuels to a clean one on um, electricity is led by our uh, first lady. 53% um, of our cabinet right now, we are women. This is the first cabinet uh, in Costa Rica uh, with this level of women um, involvement. We have a vice president that is not only a woman, but is the first Afro-American woman um, to exercise uh, that role. And she's also our chancellor. So Costa Rican women are at the forefront, uh, not only of climate change, but of our economic decisions. And uh, just to say, I mean, the face of what we're doing on climate change definitely is Christiana Figueres and her power behind her. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Canadian who also has a 50% female um, parliament cabinet uh, can hear that, um, unfortunately, and I'm going to switch to audio again, given the connection. Um, President Heine, you mentioned at the beginning that in the Marshall Islands, only 3% of the parliament uh, are women. Uh, and, and so it makes it even more remarkable that you are the president of this country as a woman um, who has been really championing uh, this question. Of, of climate change and, and the very dramatic, and I can't underscore enough, you know, how dramatic the, the situation is in the Marshall Islands. What has been your experience as, as the first female woman um, leader in the Pacific? What are the kind of challenges and opportunities that, that come with that? And particularly when you're talking uh, yes, uh, Hiba, the, uh, the percentage I uh, quoted, I believe I said 9% of our parliament is, uh, is, is, is women. Uh, I'm there are three of uh, three altogether. Uh, but um, 
Yeah, we have a long way to go. Uh, there's no question there that uh, we have to uh, get more women involved at all level of decision making in my country. Uh, but being, uh, you know, in this role as uh, president of the Marshall Islands is, uh, is no doubt being a, a, an opportunity. You know, I I've, uh, look at it as uh, opportunity more than anything else uh, for for me to be involved in, in decision making at the highest level in this country. Uh, it, it is also a, a very serious responsibility uh, being the first women to be president in, in my part of the world uh, is added responsibility. I think uh, uh, it's, it's important for me to succeed as a women leader uh, to show that women can be leader and be successful at that along with our main leader and leaders. And so um, that added responsibility makes, uh, makes, makes it uh, extra hard uh, to try to, uh, to perform and to do uh, to my job because I, I think um, uh, I need to do twice as much as a man leader in order to be successful. In, in this role. And uh, I believe that in many other situations, this is the same for, for many women. You have to work twice as hard to be recognized for what you do. And so I've tried to, you know, that is something that I keep in the back of my mind all the time, that I need to work twice as hard to be able to, uh, to, be, to be given the credit that uh, women really can do the job. So it is not only a very difficult, but, you know, it's a lot of the time it's lonely. You know, I do go to meetings of Pacific leaders. And uh, uh, now that uh, we have a, a women prime minister from New Zealand, now there are two women in our uh, group of uh, Pacific leaders that are mostly men. So, you know, it's not easy being there with all the men and, you know, you're by yourself and, um it's it's just not uh, not the same, and so uh, as, as I said, you have to not only work twice as hard, but you have to uh, be exemplary in in, in areas uh, that can make uh, other men leaders take you seriously. And uh, I know that at the very beginning, I didn't feel like I was taken very seriously, but I think the more and more we can show that we we're very serious, uh, we're committed to the work. I think uh, then uh, you can be taken seriously and be listened to. Uh, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's uh, my contribution there in, in terms of uh, being a woman leader. In this, uh, I found that very honest and quite moving, actually. Um, and in particular, uh, it made me think of the New Zealand Prime Minister, um, as you mentioned, who brought her daughter, who was three months old, to the UN General Assembly. Um, you know, just how much it is true that women have to do um, often double the work, but I think can often have double the impact. Um, and I and we've just heard examples at, at what Winnie was describing at the local level, what the vice minister was describing at the national level, and what you yourself are an example of at the international level in terms of women really playing a leading role in the fight against climate change. Um, but in the in the same way, I think that that women are helping push climate action forward, um, climate action can also help women forward. Um, and so I, I want to kind of flip the switch and talk a little bit about how climate action can lead to women's empowerment. And, and thought I'd turn to you, Caroline, um, because this is a big part of CARE's work. Um, so what is the relationship between climate action and women's empowerment? And, and how do you at CARE try to ensure that all climate solutions that you're working on are, are gender responsive? Great, thank you, thank you, and I just um, thank you, uh, President, for sharing uh, your experience as a as a woman leader at the very top. Um, I just have to say, um, I you know, at the World Bank when I was um, working there as one of the, the managers there, I I had to take my baby to work to to breastfeed this baby, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this, but let me share this. Um, that was not done, so I felt like I was bringing a little alien into the office environment of these um, people, very serious uh, technical people, technical crats in the, in the World Bank. So I took this little baby to work every day. So let me go on to your question, Heather. Um, that, you know, basically there's fundamental changes we need everywhere. Um, 
But on, on your question, um, you know, in today's world, we have this big challenge of climate change. We're, we're facing these natural disasters. We have conflicts. Um, but on top of that, we also have economic fragility. And I think this is, this is quite, kind of a big mix of, of challenges that we see. But I think this also is an opportunity to do things very, very differently. So in, in response to your question, I want to focus on what we can do differently around the, these issues of women's role and, and empowerment. And the first area, I've got three, three, three tips. And the first area is really around how can we effectively work at the community level that can be more gender inclusive. And I think the mistake that many organizations um, do is they say, okay, we're, we're, we're doing empowerment, we're empowering the women, but you know, it's actually very difficult to work effectively at the community level. You can't just do empowerment. You know, empowerment isn't just about giving women training or, or alone, it's, it's about it's about fundamentally changing the relationships and social structures that, that you know, shape the lives of, of women and girls. And, and that's when it gets a lot more complicated and a lot more serious. And I don't think um, a lot of organizations have got that right. And we at CARE, we've, we constantly try and do better because it's, it's tough wherever you are. And like I say, we've got all these, you know, kind of interlocking challenges now, whether it's climate change, economic, natural disasters, conflict, humanitarian crises. So they're all interlocking to produce a very different dynamic at the community level. But I'll just share one, one example with you about how we are trying to work better and more effectively at the community level. And it's linked to our renewable energy program in Africa. And as we know, there's over 650 million Africans who don't have access to modern energy. This could be a massive global crisis if Africa decides to take the high carbon pathway. But we're trying to work with communities to take a low carbon transition. And women are part of that solution. If Africa takes a low carbon solution, that will be a global public good. So that's, that's how you know, important it is to include women. And what we're doing is we're working in the, the village, you know, we're working in a lot of villages around Kenya, Rwanda, in Tanzania and we're trying to promote renewable energy and while furthering you know trying to ensure that women have some kind of economic engagement and empowerment and we have the members of the community were trained to to sell almost 885,000 clean energy products and I think you know these were improved cook stoves etc and what they do is they, they sell these climate friendly products and this led to a massive reduction of carbon. We estimate about 30,000 tons worth. And I think that's quite significant. You can see that there's multiple benefits, but you have to engage correctly at the community level. You can't come in from a top down. We work with a lot of local partners to enable us to better understand the dynamics and the politics and the social structures. It's not just about selling the products, it's about empowering the women. So that would be my first point, just very, very briefly, on how do we really effectively empower women so they can be agents of change. My second point is really links back to a bit of a discussion here today, and it's around human rights and gender equality. And I think CARE has you know, strongly advocated for us to keep pushing on the inclusion of human rights and gender equality in many of the global agreements, we were very active around Paris at COP21 and in other global di dialogues like the G7, etc., wherever we have an opportunity. We're making progress, but not enough. And my final comment, I think, is quite important, really, and it's around the humanitarian ecosystem. And this is, as we know, incredibly linked to climate change. And I think going forward, we're going to have more crises but they need not be protracted because now we've got, you know, in a much better position to be able to predict humanitarian crisis needs going forward. We can plan much better and we can connect the community to the regional, to the country. So the humanitarian system currently, it saves so many lives per year. So the system is working well, but what we would like to see is actually a radical change. And I think 
the radical shift that we'd like to see is a transfer of power and resources to effective women and to women-led organisations in order to collectively provide faster, better, and more assistance for all effective people. So in the past, humanitarian uh, kind of the, the system has come from the top and very effectively saved lives. What we're trying to do at CARE is work with local organizations, enable our um, humanitarian response to be locally driven and be very focused on how do we include women in these very difficult humanitarian responses. So we're working on that now and we can see that makes a difference. We can't just say it's humanitarian aid and we have to move quickly, therefore we, we're just not you know, including the local organizations or women. So we're really trying to work out ways in which we can do that and we can see successes on the ground. Yeah, we're, we're losing you a little bit um, in and out, but I'm going to turn to Winnie to just kind of um, take that notion forward because you've been talking about the importance of in everything that um, we do, whether it's humanitarian aid work or um, climate action, that there, the lens of how do we shift the power dynamics for women and girls needs to be taken into account. When you, how do you see that relationship between fighting climate change and and protecting or or furthering women's rights? How how do those two work together? Hepa, I I see climate justice and gender justice as one struggle. They are tied together. So, and why is that? It's because women are worse affected by climate impacts because they enjoy less rights than men. Let me explain a little here. In our responses to climate change, if we don't fight for more equal societies, we will lose the battle. We need far-reaching changes to the dominant economic model because the economic model has wired in inequality of men and women and takes advantage of women's subordinate roles to profit those who sit at the top. So we need to do to run our economies differently and do our politics differently. We need big changes in parliaments, in boardrooms, in the workplace, and even in the home. We need to equalize power in all those spaces for us to solve this problem of climate change. Look at the economic model. Women and men have rigid gender roles. The roles in the economy are gendered. That itself creates different challenges for men and women. So we need to remove the sex stereotyping of roles in the economy. We need, we need to look at the whole economy and, and be able to start to understand that the way that we have treated the environment is the way women are treated in the way the economy is run. Women's burdens of unpaid care work, their unequal burden of unpaid care work, means that women's contributions to the economy are not fully counted. Equally, the cost of the environment to the economy is not fully counted. So that's why I talk some, we say it's a rigged economic model. It's rigged in the sense that it maximizes for some men at the top, owners of capital and technology, and it's rigged against the majority of women. It's rigged against the environment. So that's why we call for unrigging of an economic model. And that means doing business totally different. That means counting the economy differently, not just pursuing growth for growth's sake, but counting the things that matter to our lives, that children are healthy, that they go to school, that communities are cohesive, that they work together, that they are safe places. These things must be what is counted in measuring an economy, not merely goods and services and who gets profits. So I can give you an example of a, a woman in Nigeria we have worked with, one of many women, a smallholder farmer and a teacher in Kaduna. 
we call her a female food hero because she won a contest, a reality TV contest, where she showed her capacity to lead at the community level to solve the challenge of climate change, to feed her family and to contribute to her community. She won a prize and she used her money to buy her own land, to register her own title in her name, challenging the convention that women don't own land. So as well as running her own farm, she leads her community now on issues of climate change. She's using her fame on TV to challenge policymakers to act on climate change. Last year, she came to America, went around the United States, raising awareness of the challenges to women farmers, of the changing climate, and so on. These four female food heroes, we have so many of them now because the contest goes on every year a couple of times. They're in Nigeria, they're in Ethiopia, they're in Tanzania. They are changing norms, changing mindsets about the role of women as leaders at the community level and at other levels. So we need to do things differently. I agree with Lorena. We need to have an integral approach to how we challenge tradition, culture, and economic structures and political structures. So women at the bottom are not passive victims. They are fighting back. And by visibilizing how they struggle and how they fight back, we are able to help them to claim their rights, their equality, and to help them solve the problems of climate change. So we need more and more of women's voices at every level of decision-making and to tie this in into responses on climate change. Thank you so much for that reality check, Winnie, in, in terms of putting into um, the political context the, the discussions that we're having today. Um, Vice Minister Lorena, I mean, I want to give a few more concrete examples of best practice. And in Costa Rica, um, you have what I uh, understand is, is called the For All Coalition, in which you are promoting women's participation in policy development, in gender-based solutions to fighting climate change. Can you um, tell us how that works as, as yes, one example, one, one model that, that can be emulated? Thank you, Heba. Um, yes, um, one of the things that we need to understand is that um, since Costa Rica has been leading a lot of the negotiations in trying to bring these topics into the environmental arena, we realize that even though some countries are embracing these principles, they really do not know how, at the international level, uh, really bring coherence among them. So For All Coalition is an initiative that has been uh, developed for parties around the world who want to have a more clear understanding on how they can really mainstream gender consideration and human rights into all the environmental uh, multilateral agreements, not only climate change, but also on biodiversity, on drylands, on wetlands. So for all coalition, uh, what it does, it, it provides the ministries of foreign affairs and the ministries of all environment around the world with clear understanding on how they can move forward this agenda at the international level and then at the national level. The good thing about For All Coalition, it brings the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, it brings UN Women, it's under the sponsorship of the Secretary General of the UN, it also helps bring coherence. But a lot of the things that we're talking about making sure that women can participate in a different way need to be crafted at that international level so it can really be implemented sometimes uh, on the ground. And I want to refer to what Caroline was saying about working, for example, in Africa. For all coalition, Caroline, for example, could help um, Costa Rica share with other African countries how we're doing our decarbonization plan and how we're moving into Costa Rica is one of those countries in which we have grown despite the fact that we have embraced a very strong environmental commitments. 52% protected um, category of management of our um, ecosystems. So for all coalition is this 
is a platform for countries, like-minded countries, that want to really push forward these topics of um, women empowerment and gender equality, not only in climate change, but in the rest of the MIAs. And are you finding that, you say that it's having that transformative political impact that when you're talking about? As we're just starting, we have to say, but um, it is incredible right now the amount of parties that have joined uh, the coalition in just a month uh, to really um, try to implement these principles that sometimes, um, and, and, and Winnie was there when we started talking about um, gender equality and, and climate change, people were looking at us. Um, 10 years ago and saying there's there's no linkage what are you guys talking about and there is momentum we have to move this topic far beyond that when we started 10 years ago and trying to make that connection uh, now implementation is the challenge as carolyn has mentioned as catherine had mentioned it but we have to keep on pushing to make this a reality as i said Climate change uh, solutions without um, women being empowered, it's unthinkable. Uh, we will not get there if half of the population of the world is not fully empowered and engaged. We have about two minutes left. Vice Minister, I'm just going to wait for you to mute. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, so any other questions from the audience? Now is the time with the hashtag CVF Summit panel. Catherine, um, I want to come back to you because you, you started right from the start with this question of kind of the institutionalization and the challenges of change. And Winnie's describing, you know, not just change in the way we do climate programming, but really fundamental change in society that allows women to be equal um, partners in everything across the board and be uh, thus less vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Um, how, how, how does that happen? I mean, you, you talked about messaging, for example, as ways in which messaging can be changed so that it, it um, speaks to women more. And I would argue perhaps, you know, women also being a greater part of the message could have an impact in um, the way climate change is taken seriously around the world. But w what do you see as the entry points to kind of break that um, institutionalization of gender inequality? Thanks, Heba. And what an honor it is to <clears throat> be on this panel um, and to benefit from all of uh, these, women's this, these women's insights and, um, and commitment. So thank you so much to all of you. <clears throat> So I just want to pick up on, on a point that Winnie was making. Climate change, like gender inequality, is both a symptom of and a driver of global inequity, of runaway consumption, and of unsustainable development. And so it is not until we address those root causes of climate change um, and gender inequity, and it is not until we are addressing those in concert that we are actually going to be able to make the dramatic changes that we need to make in order to preserve our planet and to live together in a more sustainable way. Um, so I just want to put a name on what it is I think we've all been talking about. And the name I use for it is feminist leadership. Important to acknowledge that feminist leadership can be displayed by all of us, not just for, by female identified people. Um, one of the thinkers that I turn to to um, help me articulate what feminist leadership is, is Lorian Alexand. And she describes feminist leadership as a process of mobilizing people through their shared values and motives of understanding that leadership is about relationship, of valuing connection over disconnection and cooperation over competition, and of building mutual goals. To me, this really speaks to building power rather than having power and to mobilizing people by getting to the heart of their commitment to collective action and their understanding that they exist within the context of a community rather than by speaking to their individualistic or selfish motivations. And I think that that 
can sometimes be a trap that folks working on climate change fall into is saying you need to address climate change because you are going to be hurt as an individual or because you as an individual might benefit economically. So that's a part of the messaging task ahead of us is to really think through how we can speak about climate change and climate action in a way that speaks to those feminist uh, values of collective, collaborative um, decision making and care, really. It's about motivating care. There are also ways in which I think we can take this up institution, in institutions. So an example, uh, in Canada, um, our current government has introduced something called the Feminist International Assistance Policy. And this is a policy that is going to filter all of Canada's international assistance, including our climate finance. And it is an attempt to bring the values of female of feminist leadership into the heart of how Canada makes decisions about money it's dispersing to help people around the world adapt to the impacts of climate change and mitigate the uh, effects of climate change. And so that's, I think, just one example of the ways in which we can not only think about messaging climate action in different ways that motivate people in their collective and in their community, but also about the ways in which we can shift in institutionalized lenses um, that help us change our approaches to climate action at that scale. It's, it's really neat to, to hear kind of your philosophical takeaways from this and, um, and to think about feminist leadership um, through that lens of kind of collaborative um, collective action. Um, I, I have one question from um, social media and I thought maybe that could be a bridge into each of you giving your last thought. The question is um, that m many women have been able to kind of breach unusual places and are in many cases involved in cutting edge technology. How do we use that knowledge or tap into that knowledge that, that women have um, to tackle these global issues? Um, and maybe in, in thinking about that question, you can also frame it in the, in the larger uh, question that I have, which is, you know, we've talked about a fair bit from um, the degree to which women have a voice at the negotiating table on climate policy to the degree to which climate action is gender responsive to wider gender inequity, which makes women more vulnerable to climate change, um, to approaches to kind of encouraging um, feminist leadership, as you put it, Catherine. Um, for everyone watching, if there's one thing that you think... Um, is an entry point or a, a leverage point into scaling up um, climate heroines, uh, but also, um, as you put it, Winnie, kind of that nexus of, of gender and climate um, equality, what is it? So uh, looking for kind of the, the one priority area for you in which we should concentrate efforts um, moving forward, and then we'll wrap up with that. And, and my challenge as a journalist to you will be to, to have a one sentence answer to that, um, which forces you to be very precise in in what you see as the way forward. So uh, perhaps I can start with um, Winnie, since you've been pushing us on this wider uh, equality issue. Uh, you're still muted, though. Sorry, sorry. To win the battle on climate change, we must tackle gender inequalities and economic inequalities together. Wonderful example of a one sentence answer. I like it. Uh, Vice Minister Lorena, what is the one area in which we should concentrate our efforts? Make the financial mechanisms designed for climate change reach women. Uh, the resources are there, but they're not reaching them. And that's the way to do implementation. Excellent. Caroline? Thank you. Thank you, Haber. I think I would just throw out something completely different. I would look at our education systems globally, and I would look at the way in which we um, define how a boy should be, how a girl should be, and how at that very, very beginning of our children's lives, we are putting into their heads a discrimination, which means we will constantly have a battle until we change how we see education and gender ourselves. 
it's it's just fascinating how all of this is so interconnected. Catherine, the one area we should concentrate our efforts moving forward. Um, so many great ideas are taken already, but as a climate activist, I will challenge my fellow climate activists to think about climate change as a fundamental um, issue that speaks to community values. So I want to challenge us to um, approach climate action as a collective challenge that we need to address through distributed feminist leadership in a community value-based way. And finally, I wanted to end with you, um, President Heine. Where, where, what do you see as the way forward? Again, the, the, that nuisance of a mute button. Sorry, yes. Um, one of us spoke earlier to the women as powerful agents of change. And I think uh, that is so true. And we underestimate the solutions that come from women. And uh, I, I think going forward, we need to focus on uh, and scaling up uh, the solutions that women themselves identify and bring to, to our communities, especially in the areas of climate change. And there are so many of them out there. I know in the Marshall Islands, we have women with uh, women group who've identified some solutions for for our communities and have gone out there and, and help uh, communities with these solutions, like, uh, you know, bringing smokeless stoves to, to, to women so that they can cook without the smoke in their eyes or, or bringing uh, water filters to families. Or, you know, there are so many other uh, solutions that I think women uh, uh, bring up and uh, we just don't identify them uh, and scale them up as much as we can. And I think we should focus on those, identifying them and share them across the globe. Thank you very much um, for that inspiring conversation. Um, for more information on the impact of climate change, but also uh, for the voices of women and to try to kind of scale up, as you've just said, Madam President, um, please do visit Erin's website and subscribe to our news to stay abreast of this. Um, my name is Heba Ali. It's been a pleasure moderating this conversation. And thank you to President Heine of the Marshall Islands, Vice Minister Aguilar of Costa Rica, uh, Winnie Bianima of Oxfam International, Caroline Kende Rob of Care International, and Catherine Abreu of the Climate Action Network Canada. Enjoy the rest of the summit, and we will now leave you with a video from Commissioner Rachel Herrera of the uh, Climate Change Commission of the Philippines, who will share a statement on behalf of the Philippine Senator Loren Lagarda, who is another of um, the women champions of this summit. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Rachel Herrera lone female commissioner of the Climate Change Commission, and it is my honor to deliver this message on behalf of Senator Lauren Legarda. This panel session features inspiring stories from women taking leadership in climate action, women who champion gender equality in the decision-making process of sectors that remain heavily dominated by men, women and their efforts that continue to close the gender gap and advance the fight against climate change. I'd like to start by telling my story. When I ran as senator in 1998, I was warned to be prepared to lose if I espoused the environmental agenda. During my re-election year in 2007, many thought I was out of my mind as I championed the climate change agenda. But I took a leap of faith. In both years, I was victorious. I became the only female in Philippine history to top the Senate race twice proving that a woman with a heart for the environment can win the votes of the people amidst the politics of men. But winning the elections was just the start. I wanted to deliver on legislation that would respond to the people's needs. I wanted to make the connection that protecting the environment also means taking steps to ensure food security, to enhance livelihood and health services, provide shelter, cement peace, and embrace sustainability. In my three terms in the Senate, I have authored several landmark laws on environment and climate change, 
including the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Ecological Solid Waste and Management Act, Environmental Awareness Education Act, Renewable Energy Act, Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act, and the Climate Change Act, creating the Climate Change Commission and its amendatory law, which provides for the creation of a local climate finance mechanism called the People's Survival Fund. I also chair three committees in the Senate, namely the Committee on Foreign Relations, which facilitated the Senate concurrence on the President's ratification of the Paris Agreement, the Committee on Climate Change, which I sought the creation of, and the Committee on Finance, which facilitates the exercise of the Senate's constitutional power to make recommendations in our national budget. Transforming our budget into a climate resilient budget is an initiative that I started three cycles ago. We continue to find ways to raise the proportion of climate tagged government programs using the budgeting process as a wieldy tool in the goal to build resilience. It would not be enough to just lay down the policies. Appropriate funding must also be provided to enable a genuine transformation. And we know that much more needs to be done, especially when it comes to addressing the urgent needs of the most vulnerable communities. I am very much inspired by women-led adaptation efforts in the Philippines, including agroforestry practices, by women farmers in Montalban Rizal, and capacity building activities by the Alliance of Women Environmentalists in Karanglan, Nueva Ecija. We need to communicate more about their stories and yours that convey not the vulnerability of women in times of disasters and displacement, but their role as leaders and holders of valuable knowledge and skills that drive climate action and ambition and with the release of the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees that urges unprecedented levels of climate action in all aspects of our society we must show that women can rise to the challenge and lead the 1.5 revolution for a safer more humane and more sustainable world thank you very much